Born in 1975, Lorenzen was an energetic child with a vibrant smile. His mother, Deborah, resided with her own mother, who assisted in raising him. Despite his father Herb not living with them, he was deeply involved in his son's life. Lorenzen's dream of becoming a professional basketball player began early, and his family believed he had a natural talent for the sport. Saying this was helped further by how tall he was, his mother Deborah said he was such a long baby. She couldn't lie him down on her lap because his head would go off her knees. The minute Lorenzen started playing, he showed an instant flair for basketball with people describing him as a force of nature on the court. His parents were just as passionate about helping him succeed and making his dreams a reality. Lorenzen split his time between his mother's home in Oxford and his father's home 80 miles away in Memphis. He started off playing for Lafayette High School in Mississippi before he moved to Memphis permanently and spent his senior year playing for Booker T. Washington High School. With an array of college scholarship offers, Lorenzen had some big choices to make. Ultimately, he decided to go with the Memphis Tigers at Memphis State University and threw absolutely everything he had into it. Straight out of university, his life would change forever. He entered the 1996 NBA draft and was the seventh overall pick in the first round being drafted by the Los Angeles Clippers. Lorenzen soon married Shara Robinson, who he had known since his junior year. They had met through a basketball game. Her father was one of his coaches. Over the coming years, the couple would go on to have seven children together. In 1995, their first child Lorenzen Wright Jr. was born. After this came their eldest daughter Lauren. Twins, Lamar and Shamar, their daughter Sophia, a son called Lawson, and a daughter Sierra. Lorenzen doted on his children with those that knew him saying nothing was more important than them. In 1999, he moved from the Los Angeles Clippers to the Atlanta Hawks before being traded to the Memphis Grizzlies in 2001. His friends said he loved his newfound fame, embracing his fans and never turning anyone down for an autograph or a picture. Although overwhelming, he enjoyed this side of his career and used it as a way to give back to everyone that had supported him along the way. Professionally, he was reaching highs some could only dream of. But personally, his life would soon take a devastating turn. Sierra was born in 2002. But tragically, just 11 months later, she passed away in their family home from sudden infant death syndrome. This fueled Lorenzen to found the Sierra Simone Wright Scholarship Fund, named after his baby girl. The scholarship fund granted an annual scholarship to a Memphis high school senior who had plans to attend a Memphis area college or university. His philanthropy continued with him contributing to numerous children's charities, hosting basketball camps, contributing to children's reading programs, and visiting St. Jude Children Research Hospital. In 2006, he made the move back to the Atlanta Hawks. Two years later, he was involved in a multiplayer trade, moving from Atlanta to Sacramento Kings. And shortly after this, he moved to the Cleveland Cavaliers. Lorenzen Wright had well and truly had a very successful career, playing in over 770 NBA games, spanning an incredible 13 seasons and garnering around $50 million in contracts. But as 2010 came around, after a bad thumb injury, Lorenzen Wright retired from professional basketball. Those that knew him said that over the last few years, he had played as hard as he'd worked, and a lot of the huge fortune he had amassed during his time in the NBA was all but gone. As well as buying lavish homes and new cars, a vast amount of money had been given to various family members, friends, and the community that loved him, with one of his friends saying he was a giver. He gave to anybody who put their hand out. He bought people cars and houses, helped them open businesses and enter colleges. His custom-built 17-room home in Tennessee was repossessed, as was his $1,100,000 home in Atlanta. He was also in arrears on his $26,000 a month alimony and child support obligations, and Scherer claimed they often had creditors knocking at the door. After 13 years together, in January 2010, he and Scherer divorced. Lorenzen moved to Atlanta, 
while his ex-wife and children remained in Memphis, Tennessee. He still had a home in Tennessee and would come back and forth to see his family. Many sources state that he and Scherer still had an intimate relationship but remained separated. Sources said that Lorenzen was a serial cheater, whilst others say the infidelity definitely came from both sides. At one point in Atlanta, Lorenzen phoned a friend and told him he wanted to come back to Tennessee permanently and get back together with Shara, expressing how unhappy he was away from his family and ex-wife. Needless to say, things did appear to be on the up for Lorenzen career-wise. He had two NBA teams inviting him to try out, and he was scheduled to fly to Israel to try out for a team there. His friend and roommate, Michael, said that Lorenzen was planning on traveling back to Memphis mid-July. But in the days leading up to it, he seemed a bit on edge and not really himself. His children had already spent a lot of time with him in Atlanta over the summer, and Lorenzen was telling everyone how much fun they were all having. Watching films as a family, visiting amusement parks and water parks, and practicing basketball together. But the plan was Lorenzen was to visit Memphis for a short while and take his children back to Atlanta with him so they could spend the rest of the summer there. On July 18, 2010, with this plan in mind, Lorenzen flew back to Memphis. He had hopes of attending his sister's baby shower and proudly watch his eldest son, Lorenzen Wright Jr., play basketball. Throughout the day, he caught up with some friends and even took a picture of himself on one of his friend's phones. He then spent some of the evening at Scherer's house, leaving late into the night. Germantown police received a disturbing 911 call. Eleven gunshots could be heard in quick succession, but the words coming from the caller were unclear. When the call was silent, the dispatcher assumed it was a hang-up. The person on the end of the line would later turn out to be 34-year-old Lorenzen Wright. Lorenzen never showed up to his sister's baby shower and after repeatedly trying to get hold of him, his mother Deborah was starting to worry. He was also set to be his friend's best man, and his failure to turn up to that rang even more alarm bells. Although some of his friends thought he might have just wanted a break, when Deborah learned that her son wasn't even returning his daughter Lauren's calls, she knew she had to talk to the police. On July 22nd, Deborah filed a missing persons report, and officers arrived at Scherer's house to take some statements. Scherer told police that Lorenzen had left the house on the night of July 18th with a random man she didn't know, some drugs, and an unspecified but considerable sum of money. He was on the phone at the time and said to the person on the other end, he was going to flip something for $110,000. Scherer said after this, he got into his car with the man and was not seen or heard from again. Rumors began to circulate that Lorenzen was deeply involved in drugs, possibly even a cartel, and people wondered if this was behind his disappearance. But if he left the house with a vast amount of cash, the possibility of a robbery being at the root of what had happened was also something to be considered. Lorenzen's disappearance became a high-profile and well-publicized case straight away, and media outlets started running with the story. Eight days would pass with nothing from Lorenzen. Although she was holding out hope, Deborah said that every day that went by, she knew the outcome was looking less and less positive. Finally, the police caught a break. The 911 call that had come in would soon, finally, be followed up on. And the link was made to the missing Lorenzen. The dispatcher that had answered the call did not report what she had heard to her supervisor, nor was the call tracked in any way to try and find out the location. Failure to report the call would result in a payout to Lorenzen's family, and police acknowledged the nine days that had come and gone had hindered the investigation massively. After finally following up on the call and pinpointing the location, on July 28th, a terrible discovery was made. Lorenzen's body was found in a grassy area of southeast Shelby County. The road near his body was called Callus Cutoff, a shortcut that only people that knew the area well would be aware of. It was a route that Lorenzen would often take to visit his mother as it was a lot quicker. The severe decomposition due to the time that had lapsed and the hot summer weather had left him weighing just 57 pounds. And police said that if you knew him well, visually identifying him would have been almost impossible. When Deborah got the call, she was desperate to see her son. She thought if she followed his route and went to the location, she might find some clues as to how this had happened. Despite police trying to stop her, she forced her way under the tape and ran to where he was. 
The autopsy revealed that he had been shot at least five times, but possibly more. And the 911 call he had made that night had definitely picked up his final moments. There were two shots in his head, two bullets in his chest, and bullet fragments in his right forearm. Officers reported that there were two different shell casings nearby, implying there could have been multiple murder weapons, but no guns were found at or near the scene. Despite this, it would be some time before police officially ruled it foul play. Fans, family, and friends gathered around the scene of the crime, including Lorenzen's former teammates, and tributes began pouring in. Investigators said the area Lorenzen was found in was so quiet, so remote, and so dark at night, no matter how many times he drove down that road, he must have felt something was wrong. Unless he was forced or lured out there or his car was followed. Several days later, on August 1st, Memphis police conducted a search of Scherer's home. They found burned pieces of metal and a burnt letter addressed to both Lorenzen and Scherer. But law enforcement did not confirm if this meant anything. Neighbors said that Shara had been burning things in the garden several nights before with an unknown male which seemed out of place given how swelteringly hot the weather was. Lorenzen had a close group of friends, some of which he saw the night he went missing, and all of them were trying to piece together what had happened to him. The only thing that sprung to mind was that Lorenzen had received a phone call at some point during the evening from Cher. The call was described as unpleasant and very heated with lots of shouting coming from Cher's end. Lorenzen told his friend that he would go and see his ex-wife, hopefully calm her down, then call him later to meet back up. But Lorenzen would never make that call. A few days later, a public memorial service was held for him. One hundred of fans, family members, and friends poured into the FedEx Forum in Memphis to show their love and pay their respects. Each one of Lorenzen and Scherer's children was wearing a different team hat to honor their father's 13-year NBA career. Memphis Grizzlies owner Michael Heisley said, We should all leave this hall with the thought that we're going to do a little bit in Lorenzen's honor to make sure things like this don't happen again. That's the biggest service you could pay him. After this, things went very quiet. A year would pass with no arrests being made and no substantial movement being made either. Investigators were finding it tremendously tough to solve a high-profile case with actually very little evidence to go on and no clear motive as to why someone could want him dead. Crime in Memphis was most definitely not uncommon. In 2001, 2005, and 2007, Memphis was ranked the second most dangerous city in the nation among cities with a population of over 500,000. And according to the FBI, in the same year Lorenzen was killed, Memphis was declared the third most dangerous city in the United States. With various types of crimes being so prevalent and widespread for a long time, police were concerned they may never get the answers they need, as the reality was it could just be completely random for no real reason. In 2011, a reward for any information in the case stood at $21,000 Crime Stoppers had had less than 50 tips come in, and the fear about whether or not the case would reach a conclusion loomed over everyone. One officer recalled they weren't sure whether people were staying quiet because they genuinely didn't know what had happened or because they did know and were scared to talk. A year later, however, in 2012, a man who was already in prison asked to talk to the FBI. He said he had information regarding the case and the people involved. In 2009, he was acquitted of murdering his girlfriend and was out on bail at the time Lorenzen was killed. He was finally convicted on the lesser charge of second-degree murder and sentenced to 20 years behind bars. He said he could tell police exactly where to find the gun that killed Lorenzen and spoke about a failed plot to kill him once before. Authorities kept this very quiet but started to look into these claims carefully and thoroughly. While this was going on, Scherer was involved in a legal issue herself. As part of their divorce settlement, Lorenzen took out a $1 million life insurance policy, which was paid to Scherer one year after his death. Lorenzen specified the policy was intended for their children, but according to one source, within months of receiving the $1 million Scherer had spent all but $5.50. Lorenzen's father and executor of his estate, Herb, proceeded to sue Scherer on behalf of his grandchildren. The lawsuit claimed that Lorenzen had directed the money be spent on their children, but it was reported that the money had been spent in various other ways including almost $101,000 on new cars, $69,000 on furniture, $346,000 for a new home and renovations, $5,000 for lawn equipment, and $11,750 for a trip to New York. 
Scherer, however, insisted the family was financially sound with $1,400,000 in assets to fall back on. But she later agreed to a confidential settlement. That same year, Scherer published a book called Mr. Tell Me Anything. Part of the description read, with the constant chaos surrounding women, new acquaintances, family, and greed, their efforts would soon appear to be ultimately in vain. Combined with the newfound lies and deception, she finds herself questioning his commitment. A breaking point is reached. She makes a life-altering decision. Does it work out for her good? Did all his lies finally catch up to him? Would he or she pay the ultimate price? It painted a picture of a marriage shrouded in vengeance, greed, volatility, and violence. Eyebrows were raised, and people were left wondering if this work of fiction was far more than that. While some believe this was all based on truth, painting the relationship as toxic, others said it was nothing more than fictitious and damaging lies and wasn't based on reality and the person Lorenzen was. Scherer was interviewed by several journalists after the release and had in part this to say, it had now been seven long years since Lorenzen's body was found. The investigation into his death had become one of Memphis Police Department's most high-profile, unsolved cases. Scherer had since married and divorced and briefly dated a journalist called Kelvin Cowens, who interviewed her about her book. The pair eventually moved to Houston together with Scherer's children. Kelvin said the relationship eventually crumbled because he couldn't get past what he described as an obsession with Scherer getting money from Lorenzen's estate. November 9, 2017, Operation Rebound. Thanks to the tip-off from the man in prison five years before, officers finally located the gun believed to have been the murder weapon. It was found in the lake in Walnut, Mississippi, about 45 miles away from where Lorenzen was found. And just as the man had said, Major Darren Goods, who was helping to lead the investigation, would dub this find as Operation Rebound, describing it as a fresh look into the case. In basketball, when you get a rebound, that gives you a second chance, he said. This would give us a second chance to bring some closure to this case and give this grieving family some relief. The man that had tipped investigators off about the gun and the plan to kill Lorenzen would soon be revealed to be Jimmy Martin. Jimmy Martin was actually Scherer's cousin. A month later, in December 2017, huge and shocking new developments were announced. Billy Ray Turner, a Shelby County landscaper and church deacon, was indicted on first-degree murder charges and held on a $1 million bond, which would soon be upped to $15 million. The gun that had been found at the bottom of the lake was traced back to him. Billy was a deacon in Scherer's church and had done some yard work for the Wright family before. Rumors had been swirling that Billy and Scherer were actually romantically involved. For days later, Scherer Wright Robinson was also arrested in California and would be held on a $20 million bond. While a lot of people were left shocked that Lorenzen's ex-wife could be involved, those close to Lorenzen said this revelation came as no surprise. Officers believed that Scherer had tried to kill Lorenzen before, and according to Jimmy's statement, this happened when Scherer went to Atlanta to see Lorenzen. While she was in his home, she had left a window unlocked, with the intent of Jimmy and Billy entering the home at night and killing him. According to Jimmy, this is exactly what he and Billy did. As they opened the window and crept inside, they noticed Lorenzen's roommate Michael happened to be asleep downstairs. They also realized that Lorenzen was not home. The pair quickly left and a new plan was laid out. According to everything police knew, Lorenzen was somehow lured into the grassy area where he was met with Cher and Billy. Officers felt strongly that they could put Cher at the scene, but it remains unconfirmed as to whether or not she pulled the trigger on either gun. After he had been killed, Jimmy said the pair confessed to him and he said he would help them clean up the crime scene. Jimmy said that he used a metal detector to help find one of the guns that had been dropped in the commotion. And after Jimmy and Billy cleaned everything up, the gun was thrown into the lake miles away. A trial date of September 16, 2019 was set for both Scherer and Billy. They were expected to be tried at the same time as co-defendants. Scherer and Billy's defense would center heavily around Jimmy's credibility as a witness, with Scherer going as far as to claim Jimmy had more evidence pointing to him as the killer than she did, and both legal teams saying that Jimmy's violent history was enough to prove that he himself was probably behind all this. 
When Billy was arrested he had a gun on him, so he still had the charge of an illegal possession of a firearm hanging over his head, as well as the first-degree murder charge. The firearm charge alone carried a potential sentence of up to 20 years. Billy and his lawyer decided it was safer to plead guilty to the firearms charge. After Scherer's lawyers learned about the plea, they started to worry that Billy and his team could use this as leverage to testify against Scherer. Her legal team described this as being disastrous if it were to happen. After this, in an unscheduled court hearing, Scherer walked into the courtroom. Scherer entered a plea of guilty to the lesser charge of facilitation of first-degree murder and the attempted facilitation of first-degree murder. She said, I'm just going to say, because of my children, I have made this decision. And because of them, I'm not going to go into many more details right now, but I'm just going to say everything is not what it seems. In exchange for her plea, she was sentenced to 30 years in prison and will be eligible for parole after serving 30% of her sentence, roughly nine years. A possibility that left those who knew and loved Lorenzen very upset. Despite many pushbacks due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Billy Ray Turner was next to face the courts. He pleaded not guilty to all counts. Jimmy, who had been granted immunity, along with many other witnesses and experts, took to the stand. The lead prosecutor, Paul Hagerman, painted a picture of Billy as a key participant in the plan to lure Lorenzen from his home. He did however acknowledge that Billy could have been left vulnerable to Scherer's manipulation because she was his trusted friend, an alleged secret love interest. Flare-ups between the lawyers and the judge in the courtroom would also happen on occasion. In March 2022, after just two hours of deliberations, Billy Ray Turner was convicted of first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, and attempted first-degree murder. He was handed a life sentence. Judge Lee Coffey, who had presided over everything, was praised for his work throughout the hearings and trial. With three different versions of events and one story that will never come to light, it is likely that the full truth of what happened that night and the reason behind why it happened will never be known. The former director of Memphis Police, Tony Armstrong, said, The only motive is, he was worth more dead than he was alive. These kids, they suffered. Not only was their father taken, their mother's gone too. There are no winners. Lorenzen's pastor said, Not only was he physically murdered, but his character was assassinated. I want people to know who Lorenzen Wright was, the kind of human he was. Too many people bought into the lies. We're trying our best to cleanse the name of Lorenzen. Lorenzen's children still work to keep their father's name and legacy alive. Lorenzen Wright Jr. was a basketball player too and worked as a coach training high school students. Lauren Wright is married and resides in Charlotte, North Carolina, and some sources say has the guardianship of her sister Sophia. Lorenzen's twin boys, Lamar and Shamar, are also basketball players, playing for the SIU Edwardsville Cougars in the NCAA. Little is known about Lawson, apart from the fact he resides in Texas and supports his siblings in everything they do. They all believe their mother's innocence, and they remain a tight family unit. Sadly, the relationship between Deborah and her grandchildren became distant after the arrest and conviction of Shara. Deborah has since reconnected with Shamar and hopes one day to gain back the closeness with her other grandchildren. She said for now, she will love them from afar. Lorenzen's parents were such a driving force in pushing the case and continuing to keep their son's story alive in the media. I knew I couldn't give up, Deborah said. If I gave up, who was going to take my place? Discover the chilling world of secret crime mysteries, where we delve into the most perplexing cold cases and unsolved crimes. Join us as we unravel hidden clues and explore haunting mysteries. Subscribe now and be part of the journey to bring these cases to light. Grateful Doe was a young male estimated to have been between the ages of 15-21 years of age at the time of his death. He was found in the passenger side of a VW Vanagon on the side of a road on Route 58 West. The vehicle had hit a pair of trees, and neither he nor the driver of the vehicle had been wearing seatbelts. The accident occurred in 1995, and the driver had been quickly identified as Michael Hager. The passenger, however, had no identification on him. He only had two scalped Grateful Dead concert tickets, a dollar and quarters, and a yellow Bic lighter. He was given the name because he was wearing a Grateful Dead t-shirt and swells the tickets. 
It was thought by police that Grateful Doe was hitchhiking, and Michael Hager picked him up because he'd been wearing a Grateful Dead t-shirt because Hager had also liked the band. Neither young men had drugs or alcohol in their system, and police theorized that Hager had fallen asleep at the wheel. Grateful Doe had severe lacerations on his face. Thus, a post-mortem photograph wasn't released to the public. They input his fingerprints, but they never had any results. There had been a note recovered from the scene that said, Jason, sorry, we had to go see you around. Call me. Then there was a number and it was signed Carolyn T and Carolyn O. The police attempted to locate the Carolyns, but because the number had no area code, it was a near impossible task. Grateful Doe had brown eyes, long curly brown, or darker blonde hair color that had recently been colored red. He had a star tattoo on his upper left arm and another faded tattoo on his right arm. He had been wearing a beaded necklace, had his left ear pierced but wasn't wearing an earring, and had a scar on his back. He had been cross-referenced with over 200 missing persons but never found a match. In 2013, police had released a digital reconstruction of Grateful Doe, and in 2014, the website WebSleuth put out a massive social media campaign to attempt to get the case solved before the 20th anniversary of his death. The campaign had his digital image shared on Imager, Reddit, and on Grateful Dead forums, BuzzFeed, and local media. The mantra was simple. We just need to get this to be seen at the right place at the right time by the right eyes. The social media blitz was successful and two men replied having known Grateful Doe as teens and were able to get the post to his family. January 13th, 2015, Margareta Evans posted on the Grateful Doe Facebook page, OMG, this is my son. Grateful Doe was officially identified as Jason Callahan. He had left home on June 1st to follow a Grateful Dead summer tour. He was 18 when he left home and hadn't even made it four weeks into the summer tour before the accident. He was never declared missing because his family had wanted to believe he had just picked up and started a life somewhere. After nearly 20 years, it hadn't been the news wanted to hear. Police credit the site WebSleuths for organizing a successful social media campaign that had served its purpose to find someone who knew him. Before we continue, 90% of you haven't subscribed to our channel, so if you like this video, please subscribe. It motivates us to make more content for you. Okay, let's continue. Jacob was 11 years old in 1989. He was from St. Joseph, Minnesota, and October 22nd, he was abducted. He had been out biking with his younger brother and his friend Aaron Larson at around 9 p.m. They had gone to a corner store only four blocks from their home to rent a movie. Before they went out, they had called their parents who were at a dinner party to ask their mother for permission to go out. She adamantly said no because it was already dark, and she was concerned cars wouldn't be able to see them biking. When they hung up the phone, they revised their plan and spoke to their father, telling him they would have flashlights and wear reflective vests. Their father felt it was a well-thought-out plan, and since it was the three of them, he said it was fine. On their way back, on a particularly dark stretch of road, a man in dark clothing and a mask jumped out of a driveway. He had a revolver and ordered the boys to throw their bikes into the ditch and lie face down on the ground. The boys complied. Then the masked man asked each boy to give him their ages. Jacob's younger brother was told to run to a nearby wooded area and not to turn around or he would be shot. He next demanded the remaining boys show him their faces. Then he told Aaron to run into the woods and not look back or he would be shot. Then he grabbed Jacob by the elbow and began dragging him away. This was the last time Jacob was seen. The two boys sprinted home. 911 was called and their parents were contacted. Within six minutes of the 911 call, a sheriff's deputy was on the scene. When he found the boys' bikes, he immediately called for backup. Additionally, the FBI were alerted. Throughout the night, Jacob was searched for, and over the next few days, the search began to dwindle with no suspects or evidence. The case quickly went cold. Joy Baker had been 32 when Jacob had been abducted. She remembered the missing posters, the ongoing theories, the pleads of Jacob's mother on TV to bring him home, and it had haunted her. She often thought back on it as she raised her own children. Two decades had passed since Jacob's abduction when she started blogging about her investigation. She had heard of a man who had come forward with a story that was eerily similar to Jacob's abduction. 
Jared Sherrill had been 12 when he was walking home from a local cafe in Cold Spring, Minnesota, only 12 miles from St. Joseph's. A man in a car slowed down and asked him for directions. When Jared stopped walking to point, the man grabbed him and pulled him inside his vehicle. He was driven to a remote area and sexually assaulted. The man drove him back into town and asked him repeatedly if he recognized him. When Jared said no, he let him out of the vehicle and told him to run, and if he looked back, he would be shot. The traumatic incident had happened nine months before Jared's abduction, and it made you think that maybe the man in the attacks was the same. Investigators on the case had told her they were unrelated and were convinced so. Baker pursued every lead available to her and then some. She reached out to Jared and the two began to piece evidence together, and they found more unsolved sexual assault involving young boys in the area. Each boy said the same thing about the man. He had told them to run or I'll blow your head off or something similar. Baker alerted the Stearns County Sheriff's Office who had told them they had never heard of these assaults, but didn't believe they were connected to Jacob. Joy and Jared spent hours, hundreds of hours, searching for the other victims and getting their stories straight from the source. They relentlessly harassed the county sheriff's office. They did interviews with local media. They involved Jacob's mother. The story was featured on John Walsh's CNN TV show, The Hunt. This was the final media push that made the FBI take action and relaunch the investigation. DNA evidence that have been collected from Jared's sexual assault was retested in 2015, and it hit a match Danny James Heinrich. Although the statute of limitations were up for his case, he couldn't be charged with Jared's assault, and a search led to the discovery of child pornography in Heinrich's home. Heinrich was offered a plea deal, and part of the deal was to reveal the location of Jacob's body. He accepted, and on September 1, 2016, he led investigators to the burial site. On September 3rd, an announcement was made that Jacob's body had been found and identified. Unfortunately, the plea bargain meant that Heinrich would only be charged for the child pornography possession, and he would serve a maximum sentence of 20 years in a federal medical center in Massachusetts. Joy Baker and Jared Sherrill were the reason the FBI reopened the investigation. Jacob's mother publicly thanked the pair for their dedication to see this crime through to the end. Joy blogged the entire experience, and I will link her blog in the description box below. On September 16, 2001, a young man in his early 20s checked into a motel in the state of Washington. He was checked in under the name Lyle Stevick, which was an alias most likely derived from the book You Must Remember This, where the Stevick character contemplates suicide. His body was discovered by housekeeping the following day. He had hung himself in a closet with his belt. When he had checked in the previous day, he'd only paid for one night, and when he was discovered on a nightstand was $160 with a note that said for the room. Had no luggage with him, only a toothbrush and toothpaste were found in the room. He had no identification, no bank cards, no driver's license. He was 62, but only weighed 140 pounds. His clothing hung off him loosely making police think that he had lost a lot of weight recently. Detectives asked around locally to see if anyone had seen or interacted with the young man, or if any of the bus drivers had dropped him off near the motel. No leads, no missing person report matching his description. His dental records and fingerprints were run through all FBI databases. No matches. The name Lyle Stevick wasn't in any records from a phone book to data census records. The address he had given was a Best Western in the next town over, which according to them, he had never stayed at. Lyle Stevick's case, like so many others, had gone cold quickly. Although, in his case, he had gone out of his way to make his identification challenging. His death had come right after 9-11, and it had been theorized that he may have been involved with the 9-11 terror attacks. He had become a somewhat popular subject on the website, Reddit, where people shared theories but also spent hours trying to find his identity. They had put together a fundraiser to have his DNA tested, and the DNA Doe Project stepped in to help. He was identified after 17 years. His family was notified, and they decided to keep his identity withheld for privacy. It was confirmed, however, he had been a runaway, estranged from his family and struggling with mental health issues. He had been from California and was 25 when he died. His family had never reported his missing due to the estrangement. 
Some people in the Reddit community at its highest point, the subreddit had over 4,000 people strong, felt it was hard to move on after the mystery was over. They had committed so much time and emotional investment in LOL's investigation that it was hard to believe it was time to move on. A moderator for the subreddit thread was quoted as saying, it was a group of individuals working towards something really amazing, and yes, it was all worth it. In the early morning hours on June 8, 1968, a young woman was found slumped over on a park bench in Griffith Park, Los Angeles, California. Initially thought to be sleeping, the petite woman with bleach blonde hair was discovered to have died of an apparent drug overdose. Authorities noted she seemed well put together. She had manicured nails, freshly colored and styled hair, and had very uniquely shaped eyebrows. She was wearing a red and white polka dot bikini with a light overcoat and sandals. She looked like she had just walked off the beach. She had no identification, and the only jewelry she was wearing was a plain gold wedding band with the inscription, CB to EJ9420. Police have been certain that someone would be able to identify the young woman, but they were surprised when no one came to claim her. Police found she'd been staying at a nearby motel and she had been using the name Cheryl Miller. They couldn't find anything connecting her to that name and gave her the identification number Jane Doe number 18. She remained unidentified for 48 years. In 2010, Carl Kopelman was sent her file from the Doe network. He was instantly drawn to her black and white postmortem photo. He said that she looked like Marilyn Monroe. Carl was a moderator website, Web Sleuths, and was the first to do a reconstruction of the Griffith Park Jane Doe. Once the image was generated, he had posted to his Facebook page. A former colleague and friend of Copelman, Rita Ellen Hood, was on her lunch break. And while scrolling through Facebook, she saw Copelman's post on the Jane Doe. He had included all identifiable information in the case, and Rita had become fixated on the ring with the inscription. She had noted that she had a similar inscription on her own wedding band. She went home that night and logged in to the popular genealogy site Ancestry.com and began poring over records trying to find a marriage license that matched the initials and the date. Once her family would go to bed, the mother of two would continue doing the obsessive search for four weeks until she found a Charles J. Bush who married Edna Lydia J. in Detroit, Michigan on September 4, 1920. Finding this, she delved into Edna Bush's history. Edna had passed in 1932 of ill health when she was only 30 years old, but left behind two daughters. One of her daughters, Geraldine Bush, had married John Paul Manzo, and via Facebook, she found someone she'd hoped was their son. She messaged John Manzo Jr. on September 9th to ask him if he was related to Edna Bush and if Geraldine was his mother. Two days later, Manza confirmed that Edna had been his grandmother and his late mother was Geraldine Bush. Rita then asked if he knew who had been in possession of his grandmother's wedding band because a Jane Doe had turned up in California. He responded back with two words, call me. He and Rita were both nervous on the call, and he had said his sister had been missing since 1968. Rita shared all the information she had on the Jane Doe, and John was sure Jane Doe was his sister, Cheryl McMillan, had been 15 years older than John. She had been the result of their mother's first marriage. John had been from her third. He remembered her faintly, but fondly. He said that he had fond memories of Cheryl and their cousin taking him to the beach to meet boys. He remembered his big sister being doting and spoiled him. Cheryl had moved to Los Angeles after high school and had moved to California on a scholarship for UCLA. She had lost contact with her family at one point, and her mother had hired a private investigator. The investigator had found her, and she told him to tell them I'm fine. John had been told by relatives that his mother had filed a missing persons report, but when Rita Hood had contacted him, he looked into it, and police couldn't find any reports on his sister. He had also begun speaking with other relatives, and a cousin had given some details she had previously withheld. His cousin Ellen had been very close to Cheryl as they were close in age, and she had spoken to her right before her disappearance. Ellen said that Cheryl had missed a dress fitting for her wedding, and when she spoke to her about it, Cheryl promised that she would not miss the wedding, reassuring her that she was the maid of honor and nothing would stop her from attending. But Ellen knew something was different with Cheryl. When Ellen had last visited her, she was introduced to new friends of Cheryl's. 
She had also been dating a new guy with the last name Miller that Ellen felt was bad news. Cheryl had confided in Ellen that she was being used as a drug mule to bring product from Mexico into California. Ellen had assumed that Cheryl's disappearance had been a result of her running drugs. Ellen knew that Cheryl had been using drugs for some years before 1968 and wasn't surprised she had died of an overdose. Her younger brother, although saddened by the confirmation that his sister would never come back, he was also grateful for the knowledge that she hadn't simply abandoned him wordlessly. He was also glad that she had never pawned off their grandmother's wedding ring because if she had, she never would have been identified. Although police had no DNA to confirm, Cheryl had been cremated. Using photographs and family members' positive identifications, they confidently stated that Cheryl McMillan was the Griffith Park Jane Doe, and she had died in 1968 at the age of 21. After the identification, John and Rita met in person, and John said that he considers Rita to be a part of the family and is grateful that she was able to make the connection. 87-year-old Gladys Godfrey resided alone in a bungalow on Devon Drive within the Ladybrook Estate in Mansfield, England. The estate was predominantly inhabited by elderly residents, fostering a close-knit community where everyone knew one another. Being housebound, she often slept in a chair in her living room and relied on a walking frame to assist with her mobility. She was friendly and kind, well-known in her local area and a much-loved member of her community. She could often be seen standing on her front doorstep saying hello to people who pass by. She had no children but was very close to her niece Sandra. Sandra would visit her aunt once a week and the pair enjoyed a fantastic relationship. When Sandra was a child, her mother had had to work and Gladys was a huge part of her life and had helped to bring her up. Sandra had said she was like a second mother to her. On April 28, 2001, Gladys' bungalow was broken into. At roughly 3.30 in the morning, Gladys was asleep in the living room. She was awoken by a knocking at the front door. After Gladys got up from her chair and opened the door, a man stood in front of her. He pushed her back in and forced his way into the property. She was sexually assaulted after he had knocked her over. She was frail, standing at 4 foot 11 and around 6 stone, but she was able to hit the attacker with a bottle of lemonade. She scratched him and also pulled an earring from his ear before he took her bag and ran away. When the police arrived at the scene to take her statement, she was able to give them a description. The person who had attacked her was a slim, young, white man with dark hair. As she had scratched the offender during the struggle, samples were taken from underneath her fingernails. And these, coupled with the earring, were sent away to be analyzed. A partial DNA profile was found and compared against the National DNA Database. The National DNA Database, formed in 1995, holds DNA profiles and samples taken from police suspects and samples taken from crime scenes. When this partial DNA profile taken from under her nails was put through the database, it came back with no matches. Over the days that followed, her handbag and other items that had been stolen from her house were found. Her bag was discovered on Arundel Drive, and they were able to plot the other items on a map illustrating the direction the attacker had gone in. Paul Bacon was a solicitor and former president of the Nottingham Law Society. He said this demonstrated how caring the community was, as they had all worked hard to get Gladys' items back to her. He also said that based on the location of the stolen items, it was apparent that this was a local person who knew the area. But as time went by, the police were unable to identify the offender. On Saturday, September 7, 2002, Gladys had spent time at home whilst also seeing her best friend during the day. At 5.15 a.m. the following morning, the panic alarm was triggered, but the warden at her complex did not go to her bungalow. A few hours later, a neighbor went round to deliver a paper and found that Gladys' home appeared to have been ransacked. Police officers were called to the Ladybrook Estates at around 9.30 a.m. When officers entered the property, they found the body of Gladys Godfrey. It was apparent that she had been subjected to an appalling attack. A post-mortem revealed a catalog of more than 20 injuries. Clumps of her hair had been viciously pulled out. Her neck and skull had both been fractured. She had died from manual strangulation as well as head trauma. So severe were her injuries, her family were not allowed to identify her body. Her walker that she had used to get around was tipped over on its side, 
and there were blood stains near the fireplace in the living room and on the base and pillow of her bed. Based on the evidence at the scene, it appeared that the initial attack had taken place in the living room of the bungalow. As there was hair and blood by the fireplace, it appeared that she had been pushed to the ground. There was one blood mark that immediately got the attention of investigators, a footprint. Footprints can often be key pieces of evidence at a crime scene. The crime scene manager was able to ascertain that the footprint most likely belonged to a Euroland shoe. And this, coupled with the fingerprints found in the bungalow, added to the pile of evidence being gathered. After being beaten viciously, it appeared that she had been dragged into her bedroom. Whilst in her bedroom, she had been raped. Those who were known to Gladys had their fingerprints taken to compare with the fingerprints found at the crime scene. After doing this, there were still fingerprints inside the bungalow belonging to an unknown person. The community was in shock. How could a frail pensioner, who was known and loved by many, have died in such an appalling way? Detective Chief Superintendent Phil Davies said, there was no evidence of items being stolen, nor was there sign of a forced entry. He said, what is clear is that prior to her death, she endured quite severe physical and sexual abuse. Any attack on an elderly person is obviously abhorrent, but this was a very severe attack. During a press conference, Detective Inspector Stuart Bailey said that they now believed the person who had committed the first attack in April of 2001 could also be responsible for her murder, Bradley said. Because of the similarity in the two offenses, which were both in the early hours of the morning and at a weekend, we believe there could be a connection. We are considering a link. We are not saying there is definitely a link, but there is a strong possibility that these offenses could be linked. Kevin Flint, the senior investigating officer for Nottinghamshire Police said, it was one of, if not the most horrendous case that we have ever investigated. The partial DNA profile from the attack on Gladys in April 2001 was compared to the full profile taken from the scene of the murder. This came back as a match. Whoever had attacked Gladys before had come back and murdered her. The task before the officers was huge. They needed to speak with neighbors and people in the area to try and gain any knowledge that could help catch her killer. A detective constable who was knocking on doors, Phil Cumberpatch said, Every time you thought you were having a bad day, you thought of what happened to Gladys and cracked on. Although they had a DNA profile, this soon proved fruitless. Whoever had raped and murdered her had not been arrested before, and their profile was not on the national DNA database. Not only had this offender's crimes dangerously escalated and increased in brutality, but people had no way of knowing if he would attack again. Two months after the murder of Gladys Godfrey, her niece Sandra spoke at a press conference and appealed for anyone with information to come forward and talk to the police. Somebody must know something and we just hope it will shake the memory to come forward for the slightest little thing that might be interesting. The whole family is devastated by it all. Detective Inspector Stuart Bradley said, the DNA is absolutely vital in that it will be able to take us forward and we will be able to eliminate people who are put forward to the incident room very, very quickly. Nearly five months after Gladys' murder, Crime Watch ran an appeal on her case to try and generate any new leads and as much publicity as possible. Sandra told the show she was poorly and she was very frail. We did not expect her to carry on many more years. But for her to live the life she has led and then die in these circumstances, it was devastating to us all. The police kept in contact with Sandra to keep her up to date, but they still seemed no closer to closing the case. As they were still struggling to catch the killer, the police decided to change their strategy. As they had a DNA profile of the killer, they decided they would take DNA samples from all over Mansfield. It would be one of the largest elimination screenings in their history. It was voluntary, and more than 1,000 men gave samples over the following months, demonstrating how desperate the local community was to catch the killer. Unfortunately, after the mass screening was completed, the officers were back at square one. None were a match to the killer. In 2003, the Forensic Intelligence Bureau, known as the FIB, was established. Work was being carried out by scientists in Birmingham to conduct further research into familial DNA searching. Aiming to find families a DNA sample could be from, Nottingham Police Force volunteered to be one of the first to trial this new investigative tool. Francis Bates, the senior intelligence officer, led the work on familial DNA testing. The FIB worked in collaboration with the police and visited the area. 
they were able to produce a list of people that could have been related to the murderer. Richard Pynchon, the head of the FIB, said, We established the first forensic intelligence bureau in the world, which primarily was concerned with looking at DNA from scenes of crime and analyzing that and trying to forward investigations when no other information was available. The FIB would run the sample from the crime scene through the familial DNA search engine. Doing this reorders the DNA found on the DNA database in order of similarity to the sample, Richard Pynchon said. Familial DNA is the same as an eyewitness. It narrows down a list of people for the police to talk to. Nearly a year had passed since Gladys had been attacked and murdered in her own home, and the police were still searching for whoever was responsible. More than 2,500 men had been compared to the DNA sample, and they still had not been able to find a match. Those in the local community were living in fear, terrified that the killer could strike again. The police had followed more than 8,000 lines of inquiry, but had still not caught the murderer. In response to the feelings of fear, more than 2,000 free security alarms were given to older people living on the estate, and more than 1,000 personal alarms were given out too. Alongside this, Nottinghamshire County Council also issued leaflets to vulnerable people in the area, according to a BBC report urging people to check the identity of everyone who calls at their door before they let them in. Don't let anyone in unless you know who they are and if you are in any doubt, call the police. The police appealed once again to the public for help with Gladys Nee saying, I just hope somebody out there, if they know the slightest little thing, even if they think it is not important or irrelevant, then please come forward. 15 months had now passed since the brutal sexual assault and murder of 87-year-old Gladys Godfrey. When it came to the familial DNA testing, the first thing the intelligence team did was look at anyone on the familial DNA lists who was local to the area and draw up family trees to eliminate as many people as possible. Two families became the immediate priority. It was voluntary for the men in these families to offer their fingerprints and DNA to rule them out of the inquiry. These samples were compared with the killer. Just 24 hours later, the news would come in that would blow the case wide open. They had finally had a match for the DNA taken from the intimate swabs, the partial profile taken from underneath her fingernails from the first attack, and the fingerprints matched 12 of the fingerprints found in the bungalow. This was a bittersweet moment for those involved. Gladys Godfrey had been subjected to a sustained and brutal attack and had died under unimaginable circumstances. But the person responsible had now been identified. An arrest plan was drawn up and their prime suspect was soon in custody, 22-year-old Jason Ward. He was arrested at work on the December 5th and was swiftly taken to the police station to be processed and interviewed. In spite of the plethora of forensic evidence, he denied that he had anything to do with the sexual assault and murder of Gladys Godfrey. A search of his home was conducted to help build the case against him. In the search, they found a Euroland shoe. Analysis showed that it matched the footprint found at the scene. Traces of blood were found on the shoe also. This came back as a match for Gladys Godfrey. As the evidence continued to mount, he admitted to being the person who had gone into her bungalow and carried out the sexual assault. Jason Ward was charged with sexual assault and murder. After he was charged, he finally confessed to everything. Jason Ward was remanded in custody. He was also charged with the attempted rape of Gladys in April 2001. He was given the date of May 28th when he would have to go to Nottingham Crown Court. Ward had worked as a machine operator and had lived on Bentonk Street, less than two miles away from Gladys Godfrey's home. His previous address had been a quarter of a mile away. Just before the mass DNA screening had started, Ward had moved to just outside of the priority screening perimeter. According to a BBC article, he lived with his mother and father and had few friends, choosing to spend much of his time alone. He had had substance and alcohol abuse issues and had received a fine for being drunk and disorderly. Someone who knew him in school told the BBC Ward was strange, weird, and easily led. Paul Bacon, who had worked on more than 50 murder cases, was appointed as Ward's defense. He would later say in a documentary that it was really difficult to understand his motivation for the offense, adding, I think he found it difficult to understand his motivation too. It was arranged for psychiatric evaluations to be carried out on Jason Ward. At his first court appearance, he entered a plea of guilty to the burglary, indecent assault, rape, and murder of Gladys Godfrey. 
Jason Ward was sentenced psychiatric evaluations into account when deciding the punishment. Francis Bates from the Forensic Intelligence Bureau, who led the pioneering familial DNA testing that helped catch Ward, was there for the sentencing. She said, I was sat in the public gallery near the family, and to see the family's reaction and to see that they had got closure in this case meant a great deal to me. I was only a small part of the case, but to know that I had helped provide that closure was really important to me and something I still think about to this day. When talking about the vital work of familial DNA testing that had helped catch Ward, Richard Pynchon said, without that case and without those people working together, we would not have been able to prove how effective this was. This was a landmark case. It was the first time anywhere in the world that familial DNA searching had solved a murder. The murder of Gladys Godfrey shocked the close-knit community and devastated her family. Through the pioneering work of the FIB, familial DNA testing, and the commitment of investigators, her killer was finally brought to justice. In 1979, Glennis Susan Sharp, who preferred to be called Sue, departed from Connecticut, leaving a troubled marriage behind. Accompanied by her five children, she packed as much as she could into her vehicle and set off. She chose California to be nearer to her brother. They initially settled in Quincy, California, moving into a one-bedroom trailer recently vacated by her brother and his wife. However, the small trailer park was not ideal for the large family. Her children were John, 15, Sheila, 14, Tina, 12, Ricky, 10, and Greg, 5. Sue had heard that there was a small resort town nearby in Keddy, California that was facing financial problems and had converted their cabins into low-income housing. Keddy Cabins was once a massively successful resort destination, but by the 1980s, the cabins had gone into a state of disrepair that no longer brought the affluent crowd it once did. The family settled into cabin it was run down, but it had more space for the kids and there were lots of other families living on the grounds. The cabin had three bedrooms. Her oldest son Johnny took the unfinished basement. Her youngest boys Rick and Greg took a bedroom. Sue and Tina shared a room and Sheila had a room. All the children had friends their own age to play with and for a while it seemed like a happy place for the family. Sue's ex-husband had been in the Navy. The family was accustomed to moving around the country and they looked forward to being in one place for a while. Sue had a hard time making ends meet. She would get $250 from her ex-husband, food stamps, and was on social welfare. She was also enrolled in a federal education program that gave her money to attend classes at a local community college. She was taking business classes, and her classmates said she was a good student. She worked hard, obtained good grades, although they had also said she was a loner. She didn't join in on coffee breaks and preferred studying alone rather than in a group setting. Sue faced a lot of stigmatism in the community. People didn't like that she was on welfare, and she seemed to date a lot of men. People gossiped, accusing her of dealing drugs or sleeping with men for money. A large reason for the gossip was because Sue kept to herself. She didn't make a lot of friends. This was probably because she had spent most of her adult life moving and wasn't accustomed to establishing lasting relationships. She didn't seem to mind the isolation. She didn't really care what people have thought about her. She just looked forward to building her life into something else. She hoped to own a small business, buy a house suitable for the kids, and keep them safe. April 11th was like any other day. It was a Saturday. Johnny and his friend, Dana Wingate, had hitchhiked into nearby Quincy looking for a party. Sheila and Tina had been at a nearby cabin watching television, and Ricky and Greg had a friend over at home, Justin Eason. Justin Eason is often referred to as having the last name Smart. However, Martin Smart was his stepfather and he didn't actually have the last name Smart. Justin had recently moved to Keddy. He had been living in Montana with his father, but had recently moved in with his mother and his stepfather, Marilyn and Martin Smart. All the kids were in and out of cabin 28 all day. This was normal for the families. With everyone living so close to one another, the younger boys were out riding bikes for most of the day coming home only to eat quick dinner and then back out again. They played until it was dark before finally coming home for the night. Tina also returned to the house that evening while Sheila had planned to stay overnight at the Seabolt's house. Johnny and Dana had also plans to return that evening, 
but when they returned remains unclear. Little Greg was the first to go to bed around 8.30, then Tina around 9.30. Ricky and Justin joined Sue to watch Love Boat, and then they two go to bed around 10 p.m. Sue remains on the couch watching TV, kind of dozing off, but not really ready to turn in. More than likely, she was waiting for Johnny and Dana to return before officially going to bed. Investigators noted that it was more or less a normal Saturday evening. People came and went out of Kadi all evening heading to and from the local bar called the Backdoor Bar. During the subsequent investigation, people did note a few odd things in the night, but it wasn't anything at the time that people had really put much thought to. A dog barking in the direction of Cabin 28. Someone noticed that their cat paced in and out of the house all night when they normally slept. Another noted a back porch light on at 4 a.m. at Cabin 28. But these aren't things one immediately associates with terrible happenings. They're seemingly random. It isn't until 8 a.m. the following morning when nothing is ever the same at Kadi Cabins. At 8 a.m., Sheila Sharp makes the familiar trek over to Cabin 28. She had intended to quickly change into clothing suitable for church and go with the Seabolts. However, when she entered the home, what was found was beyond comprehension. She recognized her brother Johnny lying face up, covered in blood. There was another boy face down. They were tied at the feet. She saw a yellow blanket covering what she thought looked like another body, but she didn't know who. She ran out of the cabin screaming back to the Seabolds who called the police. Sheila and James Siebold Jr. go to cabin 28 to find the rest of the family. Looking into the windows of the cabin, they see the youngest boys and Jason Eason sleeping. They wake them by tapping on the window and insist that they crawl through the window so they don't see the horrors in the living room. Justin is sent home to his parents and the boys wait with Sheila for police. James continued to look around for survivors since Sheila didn't know who was under the blanket and the hope was to find Tina hiding. James noted that the back door of the cabin was left open. James eventually eventually gave up assuming there was no one else inside, rejoining the others outside. The crime scene wasn't contained. It was initially handled by the Plumas County Sheriff's Office. It was riddled with errors and oversights from the very beginning. Deputy Hank Clement was first to arrive. He confirmed all three bodies were deceased. Sergeant Jerry Shaver was next on the scene and began talking to a group of people outside and taking statements. At some point, Shaver and Clement walked through the house reviewing the scene. Sheriff Sylvester Doug Thomas and Assistant Sheriff Ken Shanks came next and then Don Stoy joined them. The scene now had five men walk through it, seven if you consider that James and Sheila had also entered the scene, none of whom knew how to preserve a crime scene. It wasn't until all five men had walked through that photographs of the scene were taken. Officers were doing house-by-house house welfare checks and interviewing potential witnesses, and it wasn't for several hours that officers noticed Tina was unaccounted for. The FBI were called in to investigate Tina's disappearance, but the FBI was only involved for about two weeks before handing the case back to the Plumas County Sheriff's Office. The most perplexing thing about the homicide was the fact that the three young boys slept through the whole ordeal, the fact that the killers had just left them as potential witnesses. Ricky and Greg had no recollection, and the first thing they remembered was Sheila waking them. But Justin was reported to have told his mother that he had dreamed he had heard noises in the living room, and when he opened the bedroom door he saw Sue talking to two men, Johnny and Dana, walking in the front door and began arguing with the men. A fight broke out. Tina came into the room and was quickly taken away by one of the men. It is important to note that Justin's testimonies changed at various points in his life and the most detailed recount he gave was under hypnosis. His testimony also doesn't quite line up with the evidence, but it is strongly believed that he was a witness and the trauma of the ordeal is why he doesn't have a strong consistent memory. In the home, investigators found two bloody kitchen knives which had been used with such force that one was severely bent. They also found a hammer and a pellet gun. Each victim had been bound with medical tape and electrical cords taken from various appliances around the home and an extension cord. Sheila stated that they never had medical tape before, so it was believed that at least one of the suspects brought it with them. Investigators confirmed it was Sue who was under the yellow blanket. She had just been wearing a robe, but was otherwise naked. Her underwear had been stuffed into her mouth along with a ball of tape. 
The tape in the underwear was secured to her mouth with an extension cord. Sue had been beaten with a claw hammer and stabbed multiple times. Johnny had been beaten and stabbed, but his throat was slit. Dana Wingate, however, had been strangled and beaten with a different style instrument believed to be a hammer, but wasn't among the weapons recovered. Evidence collected by investigators were drops of blood on Tina's bed, a bloody footprint in the yard, knife marks on various walls throughout the home, and a bloody fingerprint on the inside of a door frame and a banister. It is strongly believed that at least two people would have been needed to control the chaos. The killers were also in no rush. The victims died of their wounds with the exception of Dana. There were lone pools of blood on the living room floor indicating the boys had been moved at some point and repositioned. The bottom of Sue's bare feet and one of the boys' shoes were covered in blood, suggesting that at one point they were mobile and had walked through blood. Detectives noted a lack of fingerprints and identifiable DNA left at the scene. This led the detectives to believe that suspects had worn gloves and were prepared. When the initial investigation took place, forensic evidence, it wasn't commonplace for DNA to be collected such as hair, skin cells, and other transferred DNA, so it wasn't collected at the scene. All blood at the scene was determined to belong to the victims. The hope at the time was that Tina was hiding in the woods. She was known to create forts and hideouts. However, her remains were found three years later, 100 miles from Kadi near Feather Falls. Along with the remains, they found a child's blanket, a blue nylon jacket, a pair of Levi's jeans with a missing back pocket, and an empty surgical tape dispenser. In the three years between the murders and the discovery of Tina's body, the case had gone completely cold. There were rumors that the Slains had been connected to drugs, but law enforcement were never able to find a connection. No one could even definitively know the intended target for the slayings. Theories range from all the victims, but none of the victims had any real enemies or altercations. Police followed many theories putting 4,000 man-hours working the case. Detectives even ruled out the serial killers, Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Toole, who were active in the area at the time of the killings. Kadi and the rest of the Plumas County were never the same after April 11th. It changed the community. People were haunted. Many believed that someone among them had or knew who had committed the attacks. People began locking their doors at night. There were strong beliefs in the community that the Plumas County Sheriff's Office had quietly tucked the case away. Leads weren't followed, evidence wasn't checked, and some evidence was ignored completely. The Plumas County Sheriff's Department had interviewed everyone in the Keddie cabins, as well as anyone else who knew the victims. Among those interviewed was the stepfather of Jason Eason, Martin Smart. According to Smart, on the night of the murder, he and his friend John Bobo Bedet and his wife Marilyn had stopped in at cabin 28 to invite Sue to the bar with them. Sue declined and they went to the bar. At the bar, Smart had complained to the manager about the music being played. They left shortly afterwards and headed back to the smart cabin. Walking by cabin 28, Marilyn went to bed around 11 p.m., and the men went back to the bar to have more drinks. He said that he and Bo had returned home around midnight. Smart also volunteered the information to investigators that he was missing a hammer. Since police at the time hadn't released the information that a hammer was missing from the crime scene, this put Martin at the top of the suspect list. Martin had met Boba Day a few weeks before April 11th while in a veteran's hospital where Martin was receiving treatments for PTSD from serving in Vietnam. The smarts moved Boba Day into their home until he was able to get on his feet. Boba Day allegedly didn't think highly of Johnny Sharp calling him a punk. Boba Day told people in Keddie that he had been a cop previously, and Martin was friendly with most of the officers. Someone in the sheriff's department had allegedly tipped off Martin and Boba D that they were suspects, and both men quickly found work outside of California. Boba Day was thought to have gone back to Chicago, and Smart found work in Nevada. Boba Day died in Chicago in 1988. Martin wasn't the best husband, and he was said to have cheated on his wife. He was abusive and prone to violent outbursts and was involved in selling drugs. He had worked at the Keddie Hotel as a cook, but had been fired some weeks before the murders. Sue, Martin, and Marilyn had all been taking the same business courses, and it was said that Sue had been counseling Marilyn on leaving her husband. After April 11th, Martin took work in Nevada, 
and his marriage to Marilyn began to deteriorate. He had sent her a letter where it sounds as though he is confessing. The letter read as follows. I've paid a price for your love, and now I've bought it with four lives, and now you're telling me we're through. Great. Marilyn claimed that she had never opened the letter, but had found it later. She went on to state that the handwriting was definitely that of her ex-husband. After their divorce, Marilyn had gotten remarried. Martin also regularly, regularly sought counselor for his PTSD. According to the counselor, Smart had admitted to her that he killed Sue and Tina, but had nothing to do with the boys. Tina had to be killed because she had seen everything. The counselor allegedly told Plumas County Sheriff's Department what Martin had told her, but there was no evidence of that statement ever being taken. Martin died of cancer in Portland, Oregon in June 2000. Marilyn did go on the record to state she believed her ex-husband and Beau Bobadette were responsible for the murders. She said that after she had went to bed, they went back to the bar, and at 2 a.m., she woke up to find them burning unknown items in the wood stove. Although there is no evidence to corroborate her statements, it would explain why Justin was left with the younger boys sleeping. It may also explain why Justin's story changed throughout his life. He could have blocked it out from trauma or he may have been threatened to stay quiet. The cabin was demolished in 2004. In 2016, a hammer had been found in a pond near the cabins found by someone using a metal detector in the area. It matched the description of the hammer Martin had claimed to have lost. In April 2016, a knife was also recovered near the scene. The Plumas County Sheriff Department claimed to be actively investigating six suspects, and DNA recovered from the scene matched a living suspect. In a box of old evidence, one of the investigators found an audio tape directing police to the location of Tina's body. It had remained unopened in the evidence bag. None of the initial investigators had even bothered to listen to it. The knife, hammer, and tape were all sent to the FBI for testing. No word on if they have been any aid to the investigation. There is still a $5,000 reward for any leads leading to an arrest and prosecution. The lead investigators currently working the case are very confident that they will have this solved soon. They're quoted as saying, there are persons of interest still living who knew or participated in this crime and should now be worried. I definitely think any original investigators should be very concerned as there was clearly some instances of a cover up in this investigation. There really is no reason for a large amount of evidence, key evidence that had been never looked into or followed up on. Pamela Milam, a 19-year-old student at Indiana State University, was pursuing a career as an English teacher, inspired by her mentors. On September 15, 1972, during the university's rush week, Pamela, a member of the Sigma Kappa sorority, mentioned to some friends that she needed to move her car and then left the Homestead Hall. She said she would only be a few minutes, but never returned. Pamela didn't live on campus. She commuted to school daily from her childhood home, which she shared with her younger sister and parents. No one at the sorority party thought anything of Pamela not returning. They assumed she had just gone home. The next morning, however, Pamela didn't show up for work and this concerned her family. It was very unlike Pam to be so irresponsible. The following day, two of Pam's friends spotted her 1964 Pontiac in the parking lot about a block away from where it had been parked the previous day. Through the window, they could see Pam's glasses in the vehicle. The girls called Pamela's home and her father and sister, Sheila, decided to bring a spare set of keys to check out the car. When her father popped the trunk, what he saw would haunt him for the rest of his life. Pamela had been stuffed inside the trunk of her own vehicle. Her hands were tied behind her back. She had been gagged and there was tape over her mouth. She had a rope around her neck, and the same rope was used to bind her hands. The thin white rope appeared to be a clothing line. She had leaves and dirt on her body and caught in the layers of her pantyhose and pants. There were no witnesses, but the police did a thorough investigation. The lead investigator insisted on collection of soil and any trace evidence, which at the time they had no way of testing, but he believed that science would one day catch up and it may be useful. DNA was collected from Pam's blouse. With no witnesses or enemies, the case very quickly went cold. Authorities believed that a man who had been arrested several weeks after Pamela's murder was responsible. 
He had been arrested in connection to several assaults on campus. However, police were never able to link Robert Wayne Austin to Pamela. No one knew at the time, but all the evidence that have been collected would eventually come to light, and the investigator was correct. It would be used to find her killer, but for the time being, it would be tucked away in the back of the storage room waiting. 36 years later, in 2008, newly appointed Terre Haute Police Chief, Sean Keane, handed out cold cases to each of his detectives. Keane felt it was unfair that all of his detectives had cases and he didn't. So, he assigned himself the unsolved murder of Pamela Milam. Keane said that as soon as he opened the file, he couldn't put it down. He brought it home and irritated his wife by spreading out the crime scene photos in their living room. He tested the DNA from the scene and tested it against the lead suspect, Robert Wayne Austin, but was able to quickly eliminate him. It wasn't a match. He worked the case for 11 years, manually eliminating hundreds of suspects. In 2018, Keane made a decision that would either make the case or keep it cold forever. He sent the last usable sample of DNA to Parabon Nanolabs. We've talked about this before in other videos. This is the Virginia-based lab known for using DNA from companies like 23andMe and Ancestry.com to reverse engineer family trees. This company was most notable in identifying the Golden State Killer, John D. Miller, who murdered April Marie Tinsley and William Talbot, who was arrested in connection to the murder of Jay Cook and Tanya Von Kuhlenberg. If you haven't watched those videos, I will link them in the description box. Parabon was able to connect the DNA to a distant female cousin. From there, they mapped out additional family members and could begin narrowing a suspect down from the family tree. Based on the results, Keane conducted interviews and narrowed it down to a single suspect, Jeffrey Hand. Keane was disappointed to learn that Hand had already died, but using reverse paternal DNA testing, he confirmed with a 99% certainty that Hand had killed Pamela. Who was Jeffrey Hand, you might ask? Jeffrey Hand had been 23 at the time of Pamela's murder. Hand didn't live in Terre Haute, but he had lived there in some years past. In 1972, Hand had been working for a Chicago-based record company, delivering records to stores throughout Illinois and Indiana. He was around the age of university goers. He was familiar with the area, and this is what may have contributed to how he escaped unnoticed. He was young, had light hair, he had soft boyish features. He didn't look dangerous. He wouldn't have looked out of place in a university. In 1973, less than a year after Pamela's murder, Hand had picked up two hitchhikers, Jeffrey Thomas and his new wife. The couple were heading back from visiting friends in Chicago. Hand had picked them up just south of Terre Haute, and on the drive, he told the couple he needed to stop at his sister's house to see about getting some money. Hand pulled over and drew a pistol, and he demanded money from the couple. When they showed him they didn't have any money, which I mean may have explained why they were hitchhiking, Han forced them into a grain bin and told them he was holding them for ransom. After waiting for a bit, Han took Thomas out his wife's sight. They were gone for a while and while they were gone, she was able to escape the bin and run to a nearby home for help. When police arrived, they were able to easily arrest Hand. Hand also led them to Thomas's lifeless body that had been discarded in a weedy area. Thomas's autopsy revealed that he had been killed by a gunshot wound to the head, but had also been stabbed in the chest eight times and had his throat slit. His hands had also been tied behind his back much like Pamela's had been. Hand never served time for the slain of Thomas. At his trial, he was found not guilty by reason of insanity for both the murder and the kidnapping charges. Although he wasn't found guilty, he was, however, committed to a state reformatory for two years. Han's last and final encounter with the law was in January of 1978. In a mall parking lot, an off-duty officer was in the right place at the right time. He witnessed a man attempting to abduct a woman. He yelled out at which point Han ran. The deputy called for backup and pursued. Han shot at the officer, injuring him. The gunfire was returned and Hand was wounded fatally as he ran away. Hand died as a result of his injuries in 1978. He was 29 at the time of his death. Pamela's family were relieved to hear Hand had not lived a full life. However, it was bittersweet knowing that he would never face justice for the years he stole from them. They were grateful that he had been stopped before any more young women could be harmed. 
I personally hope this is the last we hear of Jeffrey Hand and that his life of crime was short. Although, given that he had already established a pattern and preference, we may discover more crimes in the future that link to Jeffrey Hand. Once again, we are seeing a rising trend of cold cases being solved by new technologies. And I'd like to point out a commendable effort from officers like Sean Keen, who stuck by the cold case no matter how long it took to get it solved, but also the officers at the beginning of the case. The ones who, even though they didn't know what exactly could be useful in the future, they still went ahead. They gathered a lot of evidence. And without their foresight, this case would have never gotten solved. A big thank you to all those involved. Linda Evans was seven years old when her mother vanished from Surrey, British Columbia, Canada, in 1961. One day, she simply disappeared, leaving Linda and her younger brother with their father, Marvin Johnson. Their father disposed of all of their mother's possessions, leaving Linda with only a few photographs and scattered memories. From an early age, she learned not to ask about her mother, as her father had a temper and a penchant for drinking. As she got older, she still had questions, but had just assumed her mother had died or had been murdered. She knew her father had known more on the subject, but no matter how close she got to him, he wouldn't talk about it. The Vancouver RCMP were going through old missing person files as part of their Missing of the Month series and reached out to Linda. Linda's father had passed some years ago of natural causes, and this stirred a desire to do some sleuthing on her own. She learned that her father had been the prime suspect in her mother's disappearance. He hadn't reported her missing for four years, and that was only because he had needed to declare her legally dead so he could remarry. Foul play was suspected and the RCMP had gone as far as digging up the yard to search for any evidence. None was found and Marvin Johnson was able to declare his wife legally dead and the case went cold. Linda found her parents' marriage license, which had given her a little more information. She had also found some documents saying her mother had lived in Carcross, Yukon. She decided to place a personal ad in the Yukon News saying, I am looking for my relatives. My grandparents' names are Margaret and Andrew Carvel, and my mother's name is Lucy and Carvel. She was born October 14, 1935 in Skagway, Alaska. She had included an email address to be reached at. She received an email from a woman who recognized the photograph of her mother. She went on to tell Linda that they were half-siblings. When Lucy and Johnson had left, she went back to the Yukon. She'd gone on to remarry and have four more children. The woman, Rhonda Glenn, had also told Linda that she had spoken to their mother, now 77 years old, and her explanation for leaving Linda and her brother was that Marvin had been abusive and had told her to leave. She said that she had tried to take them with her, but Marvin wouldn't let her, and she never made any attempts to get them again. The two have since reunited and Linda has forgiven her mother for leaving. Linda, now grandmother herself, disagrees with her mother that it was the only thing to do in the situation. Linda said she would never have left her children like that. She wants to believe the story because her mother wants her to believe the story. For now, she will leave it at that, choosing to make the most of their remaining time together. In 1983, U.S. Air Force officer William Howard Hughes failed to make his check-in at his home base in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He specialized in radar surveillance and was involved with planning and analysis of NATO's control, command, and communication surveillance systems during the Cold War. In July, he had been dispatched to the Netherlands to work with NATO officers. He was set to return August 1st, but never checked in. Initially, he was sought to have been abducted in Europe, but an investigation led to sightings and the discovery that Captain Hughes had been to 19 different bank branches in order to withdraw almost $30,000 in cash. His co-workers and family were interviewed, yielding no information regarding his whereabouts. Law enforcement agencies in the United States and overseas also failed to locate him. He was described as being worth his weight in gold if he had ever gone to the Soviets. In 1985-1986, Several French and American rocket ships had failed to launch properly and subsequently exploded, including the Challenger space shuttle. It was reported that intelligence officers believed that the rockets had been sabotaged with the help of Hughes. His sister had told news outlets in 84 that the family thought he had been captured. The U.S. government listed him as a defector, although they weren't sure. 
they said the classification was mostly for administrative purposes. In June 2018, California, a crackdown of fraudulent passports brought them to a man who had worked for the University of California for decades. His name was Barry Tim O'Byrne. Unable to explain some deficiencies in his passport, he admitted to his true name, William Howard Hughes. He had explained that during the Cold War, he had become very depressed and had up and left for California. Once he has been labeled a defector, he was scared of the repercussions. In the years since, he had been working as a number cruncher working in the health benefit department for the University of California. He had married and was living a quiet life. Friends and neighbors were shocked to find out that Tim had been a military defector. They described him as quiet, kept to himself, but had a good sense of humor and was a good friend. William Howard Hughes was arrested without incident at his home in California. He is currently awaiting trial. In 1998, Natasha Ryan was 14 years old. She had been having a tumultuous year. Her parents were having an ugly divorce, and she was experiencing bullying at school. At 14, the teen had already been experimenting with drugs and alcohol, had self-harmed, and frequently skipped school. She didn't want to be at home, and she couldn't be at school. Her boyfriend, Scott Black, was nearly a decade her senior at 22, supported her in running away. She had been found 48 hours later and brought back home. Scott had pleaded guilty to willful obstruction of a police investigation, fined, and everyone seemed to move on. On August 31, 1998, Ryan's mother recounted it was a day like any other day. She dropped off Natasha at her school. Natasha had leaned over, gave her a kiss and said, I love you. And then Natasha got out of the car and she went to work. Natasha never made it into the building that day. She had arranged for her boyfriend to pick her up a short walk away from the school. It would be five years before anyone would truly know what had happened to Natasha Ryan. Initially, it was assumed Natasha had run away again. However, her disappearance had come about at the same time a number of young women and children had been abducted. In 1999, Leonard John Fraser had confessed to five murders. The victims he confessed to having killed included Natasha Ryan. The confession was believed to have been part of an agreement with police to have him out of general population in prison. At the time of the confession, he was already serving a life sentence for the murder of nine-year-old Kira Steinhardt. A witness had even come forward saying that they had seen Ryan talking to Fraser, which had bolstered the confession. In 2001, Ryan's family held a memorial service for Natasha on what would have been her 17th birth following the confession. An extensive search had been undertaken to find Natasha, allegedly costing the Australian taxpayers $400,000. No additional evidence was found in the search, and despite never finding a body, the trial for Leonard John Fraser carried on. During the trial on April 11, 2003, Police Prosecutor Paul Rutledge announced that Fraser was not responsible for the murder of Natasha Ryan. During a police raid at a home in North Rockhampton, Ryan was discovered alive and well hiding in a cupboard. Natasha was four kilometers from her family home. Police have been tipped off that Ryan could be located at the address, and it is believed that a relative of Scott Black had placed the call. Despite reports saying she had been held captive and living in the cupboard, Ryan herself clarified that she only hid in the cupboard when guests were visiting her boyfriend. She would spend most of her time in the rest of the home with the curtains drawn and living a mostly nocturnal life. By the end of April, Natasha attended her own murder trial, testifying she had never met Fraser or the witness. Fraser was found guilty of three of the five confessed crimes and was sentenced to three indefinite life sentences. He, however, died in prison of a heart attack in 2007. The story of an 18-year-old girl thought to be dead for nearly five years attending her own murder trial caused an international media sensation. A controversial uproar was caused when the people of Australia found out how much Ryan had been given for exclusive rights to her story, and many felt she should pay back the enormous cost of her recovery. Ryan claimed she had no idea such an extensive search had been undertaken. She had seen that a man was being convicted in her murder and had called the kids' helpline. When asked why she hid from her family, she said that she'd just been angry, and she felt that she couldn't go home because she thought she would be jailed or Scott would be jailed. She put the record straight that she hadn't been pregnant or a drug addict. 
Scott wasn't holding her against her will, and it was she who would ask Scott to hide her and protect her for all the years. She described it as a childish decision that had gotten out of hand, and she didn't know how to fix it. Her boyfriend was sentenced to a three-year jail sentence and fined a total of $19,000. However, he only served 12 months. Natasha was fined $1,000 for causing a false police investigation. Ryan reunited with her family, her two siblings, and her parents. She expressed her regrets for putting her family through so much pain. Following Scott's release from prison, the two got married in a small ceremony. They now have three children, and Ryan began studying to become a nurse. The family has said that they have forgiven Natasha and Scott, but they had to earn their trust back, and they would never forget. Gabriel's case is unusual because the state where he committed his crimes does not have the death penalty. However, since his crimes occurred on federal land, federal law allowed for the death penalty to be applied. Before diving into his trial, it's important to revisit how he ended up in the court system. On August 7, 1996, 18-year-old Rachel Timmerman was invited to a card game by family friend Wayne Davis and classmate Mikey Gabrion. Wayne and Mikey came to pick up Timmerman. In the vehicle with them was also Mikey's uncle, Martin Gabrion. On the way to the card game, Martin forced everyone but Rachel out of the vehicle and he drove off with her. According to Timmerman, he hadn't driven long and pulled over near a field. He then attempted to rape her and when she fought back, he severely beat her. He raped her three times and dumped her out of the vehicle. Rachel was picked up by a passerby and was able to press charges. Gabrion was arrested and charged later that day. In the months following the assault, Rachel tried to get her life back together. She had an 18-month-old daughter, she had started a new job, and things were starting to get back into a routine. Her family expressed that she was never the same after. She had once been a bubbly, trusting girl. Now she was constantly paranoid that she was being followed. Rachel was terrified to testify against Gabriel, but she had the support of her family and Wayne Davis was also testifying. In the months leading up to the sentencing hearing, Gabriel would threaten her multiple times. She had reoccurring nightmares that he would kill her. She called police to report Gabriel's threats three times in order to leave a paper trail. Two days before the hearing, Rachel's parents noted how happy she seemed in light of the upcoming hearing. On June 3rd, she said she had a date. She said the man wanted to meet her daughter so she would be bringing her with her, and she told her parents she would be home in a few hours, but she never came back. The following morning, Rachel's father found a letter allegedly written by Rachel saying she was taking her daughter Shannon on a vacation. This concerned her father because the hearing was so close and she was just about to start her new job. The following day was the hearing and because Rachel didn't appear in court, the authorities had to drop the charges against Gabriel. After the hearing, the prosecutor in the case also received a letter, allegedly from Rachel. And in the letter, she said that Gabriel had refused to have intercourse with her and she had made up the rape allegation because she had been rejected. The prosecutor didn't believe Rachel willingly wrote this letter, if she had written it at all, and believe Rachel was in danger. A third letter was received by Rachel's father saying that she and Shannon were fine and she would call as soon as she could. That call never came and the letter stopped. On July 5th, one month after Rachel had taken her daughter on a date, the body of a young woman was found in Oxford Lake. The body was identified as Rachel Timmerman. Experts estimated she had been in the water for about a month and likely killed on the night she was last seen alive. She had been wrapped in chains, the chains were padlocked to cinder blocks, and she had duct tape over her mouth and eyes. Her autopsy revealed she had water in her lungs meaning that she had been alive when she was thrown into the lake and died of drowning. Her toddler was not found in the lake and her body was never recovered but it is believed Shannon was killed that night as well. Handwriting experts determined that the letters had been written by Rachel, but it was theorized that she had been forced to write them on June 3rd and then mailed by the killer. The primary suspect was obviously Martin Gabriel. He had fled the area before he could be arrested. And when authorities went to Gabriel's property, they found cinder blocks that had the same paint stains as the ones used to weigh Rachel down. They also found keys on the property that opened the padlocks on the chains. Martin's nephew also led police to a camping spot frequented by Gabriel. There, police found bolt cutters, duct tape, 
a woman's hair clip, and the tops of a baby bottle. In the course of the investigation, police noted several other people who had been involved in the rape case were now missing. Wayne Davis, who had also been set to testify against Gabriel, was missing and he was last seen two days after Gabriel had been released from jail. The man that Rachel was supposed to meet on that date was determined to be John Weeks. He had been the man who had picked up Rachel and Shannon. He had been a friend of Gabriel, and Weeks' girlfriend told police she had caught him talking on the phone with a woman named Rachel. When she had confronted him about it, he had assured her he wasn't cheating, and he was talking to this Rachel girl as a favor for a man named Lance. When police showed her a picture of Gabriel, she confirmed that she had met him, but he had been introduced to her as Lance. Weeks' girlfriend had reported him missing near the end of June. The local authorities passed off the ever-growing investigation onto the FBI who would have more resources to find Gabriel. The FBI had found Gabriel was using identity of a mentally disabled man from Kent County named Robert Allen. Although no one had seen Robert for a while, his social security checks were still being cashed. The FBI staked at the post office in Sherman, New York and arrested Gabriel in October 1997. The bodies of Shannon, John Weeks, and Robert Allen were never found. They are presumed to be dead. Wayne Davis's body was discovered in 2002 in Twinwood Lake, a different body of water but located in the same national park that Rachel had been found in. Gabriel was tried in 2002 for the murder of Rachel Timmerman. His trial had been a bit of a circus with Gabriel at one point firing his counsel and motioning for a mistrial accusing the judge of sleeping with an impregnating 13 to 14-year-old girls. The jury was quick to come back with a guilty verdict and he was sentenced to death. He has appealed several times, but still remains on death row in a federal prison in Terre Haute, Indiana. Lisa Montgomery made international headlines when she was found holding the newborn baby that had been cut out of her mother and had died in a vicious murder. Due to the fact that she had crossed state lines with the baby, she was charged with the death penalty for murder and kidnapping. She had left her victim, Bobby Jo Stinnett, to bleed out on her living room floor. Lisa had allegedly been abused by her parents as a child. She was allegedly sexually abused by her stepfather for many years as a young teen. She said that when her mother found out about the abuse, she threatened to kill her and kicked her out of the house at 14. Lisa was a heavy alcoholic and married at 18. Her first marriage brought her more abuse and four children. In 2004, Lisa Montgomery told her second husband, children, and immediate family members that she was pregnant and would be due around Christmas time. Lisa had been known to do this periodically. Her sister stated that she frequently lied about pregnancies and had actually undergone a surgery to get her tubes tied after a traumatic pregnancy in her early 20s. Lisa, now in her mid-30s, had an ultrasound doctored to have her name on it. Her current marriage was her second and she had no children with her second husband. She never told her husband she couldn't have any more children. Her family believes she told the lies because she liked the attention that came with them. Lisa and her husband, Kevin, bred rat terriers for a living. Lisa was using a fake name in an online forum for rat terrier enthusiasts called Ratter Chatter. Under the name Darlene Fisher, she posted that she wanted to purchase a puppy. A man in the chat room, Jason Dawson, connected Fisher to a friend of his and fellow rat terrier breeder named Bobby Joe Stinnett. In the online forum, it was well known that Bobby was pregnant and due soon. He had connected Fisher to Stanette because he knew that one of her dogs had just had a litter of puppies and had actually suggested a particular puppy that had red fur on December 15th. He passed on Bobby Joe's email address and phone number. At 23, Bobby Joe Stanette had her whole life ahead of her. She was newly married and eight months pregnant and ran a successful dog breeding business with her husband. Her and her husband, Jeff Stanette, were passionate about rat terriers and had actually met Lisa Montgomery and her husband, Kevin, at several dog shows. On the morning of December 16th, Bobby was home alone. She was waiting to meet a woman interested in one of her puppies. She had only communicated with this woman via email, but she felt safe inviting the woman into her home. The woman named Darlene was also pregnant and they were due around the same time. When there was a knock at the door, Bobby allowed the woman calling herself Darlene into her home. She made her tea and they briefly chatted for a bit. When Bobby turned around to go to the kitchen, 
Darlene pulled a neon pink rope from her baggy sweater and wrapped it around her neck. When Bobby passed out and fell to the ground, Lisa Montgomery cut open her abdomen. At some point during the incision, Bobby regained consciousness. She had blood on the bottoms of her feet, so much blood that it had pooled up and over her toes. Lisa moved behind her head using the rope she pulled while Bobby was laying on the ground until Bobby Joe once again lost consciousness. Approximately an hour after the attack, Bobby Joe's mother, Becky Harper, came by the house. She discovered Bobby Joe on the floor, called 911, and told the operator that it looked like her stomach had exploded. First responders tried to revive Bobby Joe, but their efforts were unsuccessful. She had lost too much blood. It was immediately known that the baby was no longer in the house, and it was noted that Bobby Joe's umbilical cord had been cut. An Amber Alert was issued that day to enlist the public's help. Kevin Montgomery detailed what had happened later that day. He had told the court he had heard the that day, but didn't connect that to the baby his wife had come home with. He told the court his wife had told him she'd been out shopping in Topeka on December 16, 2004 when she had gone into labor and delivered the baby at the Birth and Growth Center in Topeka. He said he had been led to believe it was his first child and he was excited. They spent most of December 17th showing off the baby at a cafe, a bank, his parents' home. They had named the baby Abigail. Police knocked on their door in the evening of December 17th. Police had used computer forensics to track down Lisa Montgomery. Lisa had been searching for weeks on how to perform C-sections, where to cut, how to remove a baby, and cut the umbilical cord. They were also able to match her vehicle to a vehicle seen in the area near the crime scene, and there was little doubt that she had committed the crime. The baby was healthy despite her violent entrance into the world. She was reunited with her father where she was named Victoria Jo Stinnett. Police did do a DNA check just to validate that the child was with her rightful parent. In her trial, the prosecutors argued that Montgomery's ex-husband knew she was lying about her pregnancy and she feared he would expose her. At around that time, he had sought custody of two of their four children and she was convinced he would use this lie against her in court. Her defense argued she had suffered a miscarriage and had taken the baby in a mental breakdown. But given her level of preparedness, the jury didn't buy this defense. The jury convicted Montgomery on kidnapping resulting in death and four days, they handed down a death sentence. She is still awaiting execution in Fort Worth, Texas where she is the only woman in the facility awaiting a death penalty. In Aurora, Colorado in 1993, five employees were shot at a Chuck E. Cheese restaurant, for died as a result of their injuries. The perpetrator was 19-year-old Nathan Dunlap. Five months prior to the shooting, he had been fired at that location for arguing with his manager about his schedule and vowed to get even. Nathan Dunlap was raised in Chicago, Illinois, Memphis, Tennessee, and Michigan before settling in Colorado. He was raised by his biological mother, stepfather. He had never met his biological father, but his stepfather had been his father figure for for almost his entire life. His mother had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and also had bipolar disorder. Dunlap himself experienced mental health issues. He had attempted suicide twice in junior high. He was evaluated and showed signs of hypomania, but no follow-up treatments or formal diagnosis were taken. When he was 15, he had committed several robberies and had been incarcerated in a juvenile detention center. But there, he experienced several erratic episodes that forced his transfer to a psychiatric hospital. When he was released, he began selling drugs and was arrested five more times on misdemeanor offenses. He began working for the Chuck E. Cheese restaurant in 1993, but was fired after having an argument with his manager over scheduled hours. Five months after his firing, he returned to the Chuck E. Cheese restaurant right before closing time. Around 9 p.m., he ordered a ham and cheese sandwich and played an arcade game. When no one was looking, he hid inside a washroom until the restaurant closed. Around 10.05, he re-emerged with a .5 caliber semi-automatic pistol. He went through the restaurant starting at the salad bar. He shot and killed 19-year-old Sylvia Crowell. He then killed 19-year-old Ben Grant, who was vacuuming. He then moved on to Colleen O'Connor, who was a 17-year-old student. He shot her execution style, 
In the kitchen, Bobby Stevens was doing dishes when he was shot in the jaw. Stevens survived by dropping to the ground and playing dead. Dunlap's last victim had been his manager, Marge Kohlberg. He had forced her to open the safe and once the safe was opened, he shot her as well. Kohlberg hadn't initially been fatally wounded and Dunlap noticed her moving. So he shot her again, this time fatally. When Dunlap ran from the restaurant, Stevens was able to go out the back door of the restaurant and run for help. Dunlap's first victim was still breathing and was rushed to the hospital, but was later declared brain dead. Bobby Stevens was the sole survivor of Dunlap's victims, but suffered extensive damage to his face and had to undergo reconstructive surgery. Twelve hours after the attack, Dunlap was arrested at his mother's home with the $1,500 that had been stolen from the restaurant safe. On May 17, 1996, Dunlap was found guilty on four counts of first-degree murder, as well as a count of attempted murder, robbery, and burglary. Nathan Dunlap was sentenced to death with an execution date set for August 2013. His execution has since been indefinitely postponed and Nathan Dunlap remains on death row. However, Colorado is looking to pass laws to remove the death penalty, but this may not apply to Dunlap's case, since his sentence was passed when the laws allowed the death penalty. I know the topic of death penalty is hotly debated. Let me know what you guys think about it and if you guys want to include where you're from and if your country has the death penalty, I think that would be really interesting. Here in Canada, we don't have the death penalty anymore, but for some people like in serial killer Robert Picton's case, I have a video on him. I will link it. I think we should have it in certain scenarios. On Friday, July 11th, 1969, Russell Metcalf had lunch with his best friend, Theodore Ted Conrad, at the Flaming Embers restaurant in Cleveland, Ohio. Russell and Ted enjoyed the restaurant's burgers, and it was conveniently located near the banks where they both worked. The lunch was typical, and the two men planned to play golf the next afternoon. However, Ted did not appear for golf the following day, and Russell never saw him again. After their lunch, Ted returned to work at the Society National Bank headquarters on Cleveland's public square with a large paper bag in hand. He made sure to show off that he had bought a fifth of whiskey and a carton of cigarettes. His 20th birthday had been the day before, so it made sense that he wanted to celebrate over the weekend. No one was concerned when Ted left the bank carrying that same bag after signing out at the end of his workday. The following Monday morning, however, the bank had two major problems, which they would ultimately realize were connected. Ted Conrad, a reliable employee, had not reported for work and could not be reached. In addition, $215,000 equivalent to approximately $1,700,000 in 2021 was missing from the bank's vault. It was quickly apparent that when Ted Conrad left the bank on July 11th, the paper bag he carried contained not only whiskey and cigarettes, but also $150,100 bills, 1250s, and 25,020s. By the time it was discovered that the money had been taken from the vault, Ted had taken full advantage of his two-day head start and was nowhere to be found. Ted was born in Denver, Colorado and spent his early years moving around the country following his father's various postings as a Navy officer. His parents eventually divorced, and Ted chose to live with his mother and older sister. His mother later remarried, giving Ted a stepfather and two stepbrothers. Ted met his friend Russell at Lakewood High School, west of Cleveland. Both boys played linebacker for the school football team, but neither of them was talented enough to start for the team. They bonded in part over the fact that they both felt like outsiders because they had both moved to Lakewood partway through high school. Ted had moved there during his sophomore year and Russell during his junior year. In high school, Ted was well-liked but not necessarily popular. He did not have a circle of close friends but was respected enough enough to get himself elected to the student council during his senior year. He was intelligent with an IQ of 135 and became a member of the National Honor Society. While Ted was well-spoken, he generally kept to himself. His classmates would later describe him as polite and clean-cut, someone who had big plans for an accomplished future. After graduating from Lakewood High in 1967, Ted enrolled at New England College in New Hampshire, where his father was working as an assistant professor of political science following his retirement from the Navy. Ted seemed to do well at the school and was even elected president of the freshman class. However, 
Ted decided to leave school after just one semester. He returned to Ohio and began taking night classes at Cuyahoga Community College. He began his job at the headquarters of the Society National Bank in January of 1969. 69. While it was not clear at the time why Ted left New England College, it would later be theorized that he eventually took the job at the bank specifically for the purpose of pulling off his heist. Ted had been obsessed with the 1968 Steve McQueen movie The Thomas Crown Affair, in which the titular character, a debonair millionaire, orchestrates a complex bank robbery just for the adventure of it and subsequently engages in a game of cat and mouse with a beautiful insurance investigator. Ted saw the film at least half a dozen times. His obsession with the film was not necessarily alarming at first. According to his friend Russell, there were plenty of other young men their age who loved Steve McQueen at the time and aspired to be like him. Seeing McQueen dressed in three-piece suits and outsmarting the authorities made the character of Thomas Crown seem like someone with an enviable lifestyle. While his manners and intelligence meant that Ted could have arguably been described as a gentleman even at his young age, Ted appears to have begun focusing on the more materialistic idea of what one should be. He convinced his grandmother to lend him money so he could buy a bright red sports car, which he drove while wearing leather driving gloves. He began trying to appear more debonair, showing off his fluency in French, skill at billiards, and love of expensive gin. His fixation with the film may have inspired him to steal from his employer. While he tried to emulate Thomas Crown's high-end lifestyle in the small ways he could, it appears that, like millionaire Thomas Crown, Ted essentially wanted to commit a major theft just for fun and to show off how clever he was rather than for financial gain. Ted had started shoplifting just to prove that he could do so successfully. Ted had called Russell on the evening he stole the money, but Russell was not at home at the time, so Ted was only able to speak to Russell's mother. Russell believes that had he been home that night, his friend would not have had to flee. I still believe had he been able to speak to me or someone else and showed us the money, he would have just put it back on Monday morning, for it was less about the money than proving he could do it, Russell would later say. As it was, Ted never got to tell Russell about the theft. Russell learned about the theft after the bank discovered it on Monday morning. Responding FBI agents called Russell, ordering him to come into the bank where he was employed to tell them everything he knew about his friend. Prior to the theft, Ted had begun telling friends, including some who worked at the bank with him, how easily he could steal from the vault because of the lax security at the bank. Society National Bank did not even fingerprint its employees. He claimed that all he needed to do was find a way to be left in the vault alone. He said he would commit the crime on a Friday because doing so would give him the entire weekend to get out of town before anyone even realized that the money was missing. Ted reportedly called a friend on July 11th to say the day had finally come for him to take the money, but the friend did not believe that Ted was actually going to commit the crime. Ted had decided to go through with the theft on that day in particular because circumstances had aligned to make it possible for him to do so. While Ted had only been employed at the bank for just over six months, he was a stellar employee his co-workers believed would rise through the ranks at the bank very quickly. He worked in the bank's vault, packaging and delivering cash to other branches of the bank, a position which the bank only allowed its most trusted employees to fill. On the day of the theft, Ted's supervisor was out of work recovering from surgery. It was against bank policy for any employee to be left alone in the vault, but Ted was essentially left unsupervised that day, meaning he had the opportunity to be alone in the vault. Since Ted was considered to be such an upstanding young man and trustworthy employee, no one at the bag was particularly concerned when he walked into the vault with the large paper bag after his lunch break. Ted was seen by his landlady at 7.26 p.m. outside of his apartment on Clifton Boulevard. He waved to her as he was getting into a cab, which took him to Cleveland Hopkins International Airport. There, he used a payphone to call his girlfriend Kathleen and tell her that he was going to Erie, Pennsylvania for the weekend to attend a concert. Ted's relationship with Kathleen would allow law enforcement to track Ted's initial movements around the country after he fled with the cash. She received a letter from Ted on July 17th that had been postmarked at Washington's National Airport and another on July 22nd postmarked in Inglewood, California, near Los Angeles International Airport. Authorities were also able to record a phone call Ted made to her. In the letters to his girlfriend, Ted admitted to stealing the money and ultimately expressed some remorse over his crime. In one of the letters, 
he indicated that he believed he could return to Ohio and his loved ones after seven years when the statute of limitations had expired. However, as smart as he was and as clever as he believed himself to be, Ted had misinterpreted the law. Authorities had to charge him within seven years and since he was so quickly identified as the perpetrator of the theft, he was indicted within weeks. The clock had stopped on the statute of limitations as soon as he had been indicted for his crimes, meaning he could be arrested no matter how much time passed. On September 12, 1969, Ted Conrad was indicted by a federal grand jury on charges of embezzlement and falsifying bank records. A warrant for his arrest was subsequently issued. He faced up to 10 years imprisonment for each of the charges against him. The FBI and the U.S. Marshals Service initially quarreled over jurisdiction in the case, which was one of the largest bank thefts in Cleveland's history. Ultimately, both agencies investigated the case. Authorities followed up on leads across the continental United States, as well as in Hawaii after a couple from Cleveland vacationing there in October of 1969 saw a man they believed resembled Ted. Ted's best friend Russell believed Ted had used the money to go abroad, perhaps to sail around the world. Russell was contacted by investigators periodically as the decades passed. They believed Russell to be the person from his life prior to the theft Ted was most likely to contact. Russell never heard from him. Every few years, authorities would get warrants for the phone records of Ted's loved ones to look for calls they could not account for and could have come from Ted, but they never found any record of him contacting anyone. The letters and calls to his girlfriend just after he left town appear to be the last communications Ted ever had with any of his loved ones. Over the years, Ted was featured in local media and on national programs such as America's Most Wanted. Deputy U. S. Marshal John Elliott remained dedicated to bringing Ted Conrad to justice even as decades passed without him being located. He continued following up on leads, submitting information to international agencies, and collecting evidence that could one day be used to prove that a suspect really was Ted Conrad should a promising one ever be identified. He was so focused on the case that it became a regular conversation topic with his family. One of the reasons I stayed after this guy is that some people thought he was some kind of hero or Robin Hood. He's not. He's nothing but a thief. A young, smart-ass thief who just managed to elude law enforcement for all these years. Hopefully, we can bring him to justice soon, John explained in 2008. Another potential reason for John's fixation with catching Ted Conrad was the multiple small ways their lives had intersected prior to the theft. Like Ted, the Elliott family lived in the suburb of Lakewood. John and Ted went to the same doctor, and Ted briefly worked in a shop where John would take his son to get ice cream. That son was Peter Elliott, who eventually followed in his father's footsteps by joining the U. S. Marshal Service. The elder Elliot retired in 1990 without ever locating and arresting Ted Conrad, but did not lose his interest in the case. He came in to go over his files in the case regularly after his retirement. Ultimately, the role of officially pursuing Conrad would fall to his son Peter. John Elliot would pass away without ever seeing the resolution to the Conrad case. He and his son, Peter, continued talking about it until the very end of his life. While John was in hospice, his son played an episode of a documentary series for him. The episode focused on the Conrad case, and John had appeared in it. John Elliott passed away in his sleep just a few days later on March 20, 2020 at the age of 83. While he spent decades obsessed with the Conrad investigation, his largest professional contribution is arguably the major role he played in Cleveland's mob wars. He helped establish the Witness Protection Program in Northern Ohio in the early 1970s, which proved vital as mob violence escalated in the following years. In the grand scheme of the investigation, John Elliott ultimately just barely missed, living long enough to see the Ted Conrad case finally be closed. Unfortunately, so did Ted Conrad. On November 12, 2021, more than 52 years after Ted Conrad's heist and escape, the U. S. Marshal Service announced that the fugitive had been identified. He had been living outside of Boston since 1970 under the name Thomas Randall. Unfortunately, he could not be arrested as he had died less than six months earlier. The major break in the case came when you S. Marsh Peter Elliott received a tip about an obituary published in the Linfield News, a weekly publication in the suburbs of Boston. 
He has not publicly disclosed who brought the obituary to his attention. The obituary was for 73-year-old Thomas Randall, who had died of lung cancer in May of 2021. According to Tom's obituary, his life overlapped with Ted Conrad's in very general ways. They had both been born in Denver and had both been born on July 10th, although Tom's birth year was listed as 1947, two years before Ted's. They shared some more specific details as well. The obituary listed Tom's alma mater as New England College, the same small school Ted had attended for a semester, and Tom's parents had the same first names, Edward and Ruthabeth, as Ted's parents. Tom and Ted's mothers also had the same maiden name, knowing that people who create false identities tend to borrow details from the real life they leave behind. Peter began investigating the possibility that Tom Randall was really Ted Conrad. One of the main pieces of evidence that confirmed that Ted Conrad had gone on to live out his life as Tom Randall after stealing from the bank had originally been preserved by Peter's father. John Elliott had been able to track down Ted Conrad's original 1967 application to New England College, which contained Ted's signature. In 2021, his son was able to track down the legal papers Tom Randall had filled out when he was filing for bankruptcy in Boston Federal Court in 2014, which included his signature. Peter was able to submit the documents for analysis, which concluded that they had been signed by the same individual. Based on further document and handwriting comparison, as well as what the U.S. Marshal Service has only described as additional investigative information, they positively identified Thomas Randall as Theodore Conrad. When Peter Elliott and his deputy went to the home where the man known in Massachusetts as Tom Randall had lived since 1986 to inform his widow that the man she had been married to for almost 40 years had not been who she believed him to be, she was not surprised by their arrival or by the news they brought. She admitted that on his deathbed, just before he became too weak to speak, her husband had disclosed to his family that his real name was Theodore Conrad and that he had been living under an assumed name because he was wanted for a bank theft he committed back in 1969. She also said he expressed remorse for his crime, a sentiment which Peter Elliott believes is genuine. No one in the Randall family will face any charges for failing to report this confession. Ted began assuming his new identity in January of 1970, when he went to the Social Security office in Boston to apply for a Social Security number using the name Thomas Randall. His location, like the first name he chose, may have been inspired by the movie that inspired his crime. The Thomas Crown Affair had been largely filmed in the Boston area. The Social Security Administration did not begin implementing the enumeration of birth process until the late 1980s, and it was common at the time for individuals to not apply for a Social Security number until they reached adulthood. When he applied for the Social Security number, he provided the same day and month for his birthday, but changed the year of his birth to 1947, two years before he was actually born. Once he was able to obtain the social security number and card, he was able to construct his new identity around it. He met a woman named Kathy in the early 1970s and married her in 1982. The couple had one daughter and remained married until the man Kathy knew as Tom died in 2021. Ted retained at least two of his major interests when he began living as Tom, golf, and luxury vehicles. In the 70s, he divided his time between Massachusetts pursuing his passion for golf, playing on the professional winter tour in Florida during the off-season, and working as a club professional at the Pembroke Country Club, south of Boston, the rest of the year. He eventually moved up from giving lessons to becoming the manager at the club. Tom then began a career selling luxury cars, working at various dealerships over the course of 40 years. According to friends of Thomas Randall, his personality was very similar to the one Ted had displayed prior to his fixation with the Thomas Crown affair and the idea of being a high-class criminal. They described him as being the definition of a gentleman with a gentle soul, polite manner, and articulate way of speaking. He was even tempered and almost never raised his voice. One friend said he probably wouldn't have believed Tom if he had told him the truth about his identity and the stolen money because it seemed so out of line with his personality. The only suspicious detail anyone could identify in retrospect, aside from the fact that Tom always had a beard, was the fact that Tom never mentioned his parents or siblings and only spoke of his early life in very broad terms. While the friends of Thomas Randall, who have spoken to the media, were all shocked to learn that he had deceived them for so long, none of them were particularly upset with their late friend on account of his crime. They largely dismissed the theft as a youthful indiscretion, 
and the actions of Ted Conrad in his youth did not color their opinion of the more mature Tom Randall, who, as one of them pointed out, did not continue into a life of further crime as far as anyone knows. While Ted, living as Tom, was able to build his life around country clubs and luxury cars, he did so through his employment, not by being wealthy himself. Despite the massive financial head start the money he stole could have given him, he struggled financially. As Thomas Randall, he and his wife filed for bankruptcy in 2014. According to court records, they had over $161,000 in credit card debt. When he died in 2021, the family was still struggling, with unpaid bills continuing to pile up. Authorities are still investigating what happened to the stolen cash. They are currently investigating the possibility that Ted lost it all with a series of bad investments shortly after he stole it. While Tom's loved ones are still struggling to cope with the news of his crime and real identity, Ted's loved ones are relieved to know what happened to him after he fled. Ted's sister was afraid she would die without ever knowing what became of her younger brother and is relieved to know that he went on to live a happy life. Ted's best friend Russell hopes to one day meet Kathy Randall so he could tell her stories of what her husband was like when he was younger. Ted Conrad never got the satisfaction he thought pulling off his crime would bring him, and investigators never got to conclude the case with the arrest they spent decades trying to make. While the case never got the dramatic conclusion anyone envisioned, U.S. Marshal Peter Elliott takes some arrest through his death. In the press release announcing that Ted arrest through his death. In the press release announcing that Ted Conrad had been identified, Peter is quoted as saying, I hope my father is resting a little easier today, knowing his investigation and his United States Marshal Service brought this closure to a decades-long mystery. Everything in real life doesn't always end like in the movies. Thank you for joining us on this journey into the depths of unsolved mysteries. Cold cases not only challenge our understanding of the past, but also ignite our curiosity and determination for answers. Remember to subscribe to stay updated on our latest investigations. And if you have any information regarding the cases we've covered, don't hesitate to reach out. Together, we can shed light on the shadows of the past and bring closure to those who seek it. Until next time, stay vigilant, stay curious, and never stop seeking the truth.